Hey, it's Elge, Simple Lines Anatomy. Uh, uh, okay, today we're going to be talking about the reverse action of the latissimus dorsi muscle. And it sounds very fancy, but it's actually nothing all that special. We've done similar posts like this in the past, and they've been about other muscles, of course. And they were in the visual form, just the text and picture form. And we're continuing this series because we thought it was of some value. So basically, this is a relationship. What we're going to be talking about is the relationship of the muscle as it attaches to certain structures and pulls on them in unique ways. And it's bidirectional. That's the important thing. It goes, goes in both directions. So the typical uh, understanding of a muscle is that we have a point that moves and a point that doesn't move and when the muscle contracts it essentially makes it so that the more moving point in this case it's it's considered the arm most often is the part that will move and the one more proximal and less moving is called the origin in the case of the latissimus dorsi it would be this portion here and in the case of the moving portion, the insertion, it would be this portion here in the arm. And this is great, but it's a limited way of looking at it. Understand, and this is not new information, understand that if you contract a muscle, uh, though there will be a pull in, in one direction, there is weight to carry, there is weight to, to move around, and so that weight also pulls in the opposite direction of what is considered normal or typical. So we have to look at it in both directions. Especially, this changes things as we add in greater weights, more than just body weight, and greater fixation. So if we were to say just stop the arm from moving entirely, we fixate it, we fix it in space, it changes the amount of pull. Now we can essentially reverse the action of the muscle. So now it will be all be pulling from arm to back as opposed to the other way around. And this seems interesting, but it's not important until you understand it as a mechanism of injury. So when that arm is stuck and it pulls in multiple different directions based on where it starts from and what it's pulling on. Uh, this can be a mechanism of injury, say, in a, uh, when your arm is being pulled on or your arm is forced into position or just long-term misuse. Uh, alternatively, as well, the manual therapy world, whether this is fascial stretch therapy, they're all over this right now, um, osteopathy, physiotherapy, you know, they use the appendages, they'll use the arm as a point of leverage, let's say, or they could use the leg for the low back, and they'll use that arm to pull into other spots, they'll use it because the body is designed like that. So this is a normal thing and it's advantageous. In this case, it has to be used with a fair amount of traction. So there's an element of pull, big pull going on here. And these things are important to know. There we go, hold on, all right, cool. So this is good. Now let's just review quickly, origin, insertion, all that, as they are typically known. We're gonna say proximal attachment point to distal attachment points. So when it comes to the lats, let's just miss dorsi, we have a big attachment, really T7 and you know some, some books will say about rib nine-ish, which is you know in around there, uh, rib nine, all the way down to the sacrum and certainly into the ilium as well. But there's something about this, there's something meaningful with this and it's because there is a shared fascia which we call the thoracolumbar fascia, or just really the, the combined tendons of a lot of different muscles in this, this region, if you don't know what that is. Um, and it means that this is not an isolated muscle. It's combined tissues involved. And so that means there are erector fibers in there. There are probably some fibers feeding into the deeper intrinsic muscles. And so we're going to be extracting this muscle as if it was separate and isolated, but it's, it's really not. This is more of a theoretical model for how it might move and how it, it could move, but understand that it is combined. So its origin, T7, give or take, all the way down to the sacrum, all the way along the iliac crest. This one also means it ties into the abdominal contents, but let's leave that for a different time. So iliac crest. Anyways, it's going to attach distally into the intertubercular groove. Now, it actually goes around the front. So I've, I've peeled off a little bit. I haven't drawn this, but it would go around. So you wouldn't see it here. 
kind of loops around like this. This is quite the exaggeration, but the muscle actually comes from behind here, goes dot, dot, dot through, and then into the intertubercular group. So between the two tubercles of the humerus, that's where that one actually attaches to. So I just need to get rid of this quick because we don't need that right now just for illustration purposes. There we go. So that's the attachments of lats. Now based on this, it has a few mechanical pulls. It has a few actions and largely it is on the arm. They would say, again, we're going with the typical model here. It is largely, oh, oh did not mean to do that. We got it. We're good. We're back. Okay. There we go. Got the right color. Cool. All right. Anyways, it is largely adduction. You can see that because the muscle would shorten along this plane. So adduction of the arm. It will also give you internal rotation. And then it can do flexion extension of the arm. Flexion extension in the arm is here. So flexion and extension. There's flexion and there's extension of the arm from a side view there. Get rid of that though. Clarity, clarity. Okay, so anyways, that's how that works. These are the main motions of that. But we can be we can be a little more specific. We're going to change that up again. Now, one thing I do want to say, look at the width of this wide attachment point. Look at this huge, huge attachment this attachment point. Look at the bulk of this whole muscle right there. That's enormous. And look at the small point it converges on. This tells you that there's a lot of mechanical advantage where it's funneling down. It's got a triangular shape. It means it's strong. We know that. I mean, that's not shocking. People with very strong lats, uh, gymnasts, for instance, people who do the rings, you know, you look at that iron cross maneuver there. It's incredibly powerful. They have very large lats, but it's very concentrated going in that triangular shape. And those triangles are, are quite strong, as we know. That's a, a basic understanding of mechanics and physics and biomechanics there. So this is a big deal. Now we can sort of, it's not as obvious as in the lats, but we can sort of separate this into sections. So we're going to separate this into triangles just again for only for illustration purposes. Uh, upper and a middle and a lower. And it's not as much as the trapezius, but there are different regions. And what you will notice, and we'll explain this, what you will notice is as we change the position of the arm, we have this kind of a inverse relationship. As the arm goes up or down, we get a change in the tension or contraction in the lats itself. So as it's the higher up it goes tends to be the lower fibers. The lower it goes tends to be the upper fibers. And other than this thing just being kind of a neat diagram, it just makes sense based on simple mechanics. I'm sure the body did not uh, evolve in the way or design itself such that it would be, you know, beautiful like this. But it just happened to work out like this in that one direction here. So if we're going in big into abduction, for instance, We'll get more of the lower fibers contracting. What you'll find too, it's a gradient and it's not a straightforward line of pull and that if you were to contract, if you had your arm into abduction, yes, you would get a lot more of the upper fibers contracting, but you would still get some, sorry, I got that backwards. You would get some of the lower fibers contracting, uh, but you would still get some gradation into the upper fibers as well. One way, one real easy way to test this is, it's funny, but you just put your arm, put it on a, a banister basically, and you can feel your lats with the other arm. You can feel that right there by just putting your arm there. And what you'll find is as you move the arm down and down, it will change where you feel the tone building in. So the higher up it is, it'll be here. As you bring it down into further and further points, you'll notice the contraction goes more higher up. Again, it is a gradient. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Get rid of that. And that, and that, and that, and that, and that, and that, and that. Good. Okay, cool. We're all right. So this is neat. It means it can specify pull. It has some accentuation to it. Now we're going to give you, we're going to give you more some specifics. So how do we generate pull in certain areas and what would that pull do as well? So just to peel the rest of this off because we don't need all of this at the moment. We're going to get rid of that. Oh, that's gone. Goodbye. And we'll go back to this. So the lats being 
again from about here to here just to make it clear if we were to have the upper fibers contract let's say we only want these upper fibers to contract that are about here we would have the arm in an adducted position we'd have it straight at our side we can do better than that there we go adducted position and when we do that it tends to prefer let's just say it's straight theoretically straight adducted it tends to prefer doing internal rotation of the arm so it wants to make the arm do this so there we go arms doing that because those fibers are almost coming straight across so i'm going to do purple in this case those fibers are coming straight across this upper portion is very good at that because it's essentially in the same plane if we were looking at here those upper fibers would be give or take right about there and it's nearly straight across in its line of pull there we go going something like that actually i could do better than that there we go it's going relatively straight across in its line of pull so it wants to do that ultimately having an internal rotation effect on the arm conversely if we fixed the arm in space we stopped it from moving entirely the pull would be exerted now instead on those upper fibers and we'd get a straight lateral translation type of pull it would it would tend to pull that spine into a bit of a side bend that way if it were somehow pure sagittal plane motion that's realistically not possible but a nice pure sagittal plane pull in the t let's say t7 to l2 area I'm, it's going to be different for everyone but definitely there would be some pull exerted on that now we can accentuate this so it gets a little more complex than that it always does let me just get rid of this again for the 300th time and if we were to change the pitch of the arm change the flexion extension of the arm you would notice a difference so let's say we started out and we have the arm in what's called flexion this is shoulder flexion arm flexion true arm flexion and let's say we made it so that it was there and the lats were still pulling it was still adducted the lats were still pulling in this region if we change the flexion not only do we get so we'll just put a we'll put a vertical axis through there and we pull this way not only do we get a bit of that side bending that straight lateral translation we should get some rotation too because it's wanting as this is forward as this comes this way it's wanting to rotate like that so we should see as well let's say this is again we change position we make this more flexed it should rotate this way at the same time that's what it's it's wanting to do that's what the driving of the lat with the arm in that position will do if on the other hand we flipped that and we made it so that the arm was instead what we call extended there we go like that draw that in there quick then you would see the opposite start to happen it would still have the lateral translation effect so you'd be, you'd be getting this going on there's the lat it's attaching into there pretty much and so as it's pulling it's pulling in that unified orientation it should rotate it essentially the opposite way so this is coming back at us this arm is now coming back at us and should rotate the opposite way now a little more complicated there we go but we're fine like that coming back at us so you can see these these motions start to build on themselves so that would be roughly how that would work individual anatomy always very different you know nothing's ever certain so now looking at the lower ones if we have the arm in adduction sorry abduction a b d abd a b d duction there we go then we start to change where the pull is so again we get that gradient going on it's pulling more this direction already this is stretched out this arm is quite stretched out and let's assume it was just abductional it's an abduction it's being pulled on or it's stopped from moving and we contract the lats it's going to start to pull on more more so those lower areas of the spine that's sacrum lower lumbar and even into the ilium like it, it does definitely pull on that stuff so it's going to be pulling like that in this situation and now it might have a vertical effect there is a capacity for that si joint to allow 
superior translation. There's a capacity for the sacrum to move in what, what you know, I think I believe they also have to call it a, a shearing kind of action. And as well, not so much the mid lumbar area, but definitely the lower lumbar area at about L5, we could certainly get some side bending happening in that area. Again, we can modify that though. These are, these are things it is capable of doing. We can modify that though by changing that forward, backwards, that flexion and extension of the arm if we, if we do that. As we change that, the lower pole, the pole of, of the lats on the sacrum, anonymate ilium and lumbar spine definitely is modified significantly like this, or, or can be with enough force. And so it will create altered poles. If it's more in the extended position, so it's all the way back, the elbow's coming all the way back here, wrong tool, there we go, all the way back here, then you're gonna find it's pulling more on a posterior direction. So if it's coming from here, guess what? It's going that way, it's gonna twist stuff a little more back that way. So you can you could see how you could get like a posterior anonymous going on, you could get a sacral rotation, there's a sacrum, it's coming back on that corner, or you could see L5 spinning. Again, these are all potentials, there's no absolutes in this. And as we flex it, as we go forward, you could get the opposite. You could say anterior anonymous here, so it's anterior instead, and you could switch all this up uh, quite easily. So, what does this all mean? What's the importance here? What's one real important takeaway from this? Really simple is that even if it's the arm that is yanked on, even if it's the arm that's injured, you, you hurt your shoulder, the scapula is tweaked, whatever, you pull your rhomboid, even theoretically, it doesn't really matter. Maybe you've been walking around for 10 years with a scapula that's protruded, you know, it's coming forward, or an arm that is always adducted and you can't lift. It will have an effect way lower than you think it will. It will have a big effect all the way down, even to the pelvis. So this and this all the way down to here are linked, whether you like it or not, by a significant muscle. And it is for a reason. So investigate fully. Anyways, that's been Simple Lines Anatomy. You can find more of our stuff on Instagram. Facebook, Twitter. We also have an app. It's the only app devoted entirely to the latissimus dorsi. And it's not very good, actually. I don't recommend buying it. 